In October of 2017, this counterintelligence officer and trained special agent by the name of Luis Elizondo stepped out of the shadowed halls of the Pentagon and in to the public spotlight. Whether he intended it or not, by doing so he would become an instant celebrity to UFO enthusiasts for saying something that would soon shake the entire world. For nearly the last decade, I ran a sensitive aerospace threat identification program focusing on unidentified aerial technologies. It was in this position I learned that the phenomenon is indeed real. Within minutes of speaking these words, the Black Vault used this once insider information to file numerous Freedom of Information Act requests to see what documents could be dug up. The idea was that in the eyes of the law, if this former government agent was talking about it, then the documents may just be ripe for the picking if one were to ask for them. So that's exactly what I did. This unfolding saga brought me hope that after more than 20 years of pushing for the truth, the veil of secrecy surrounding the UFO phenomenon might just be lifting once and for all, and things were drastically changing. Evidence of that change was revealed just two months after Elizondo stepped foot on that stage. That is when the mainstream media covered Elizondo along with his story, and it became a viral sensation all over the world. Out front now, the former Pentagon military official who ran the covert government program up until this last November, Luis Elizondo. Luis, thank you so much for your time tonight. Until he stepped out on stage last now, October alongside rock Tennessee star Tom Murray DeLong Murray and Murray other former Murray government Murray insiders, Murray. most of the world had never heard of thank Luis you. Elizondo, which is how he liked it. But as excitement exploded worldwide about this secret Pentagon UFO study known as the Advanced Aerospace Threat Identification Program, or ATIP, controversy had already begun to percolate inside the Black Vault about what was really going on. Just three weeks prior to the New York Times running their now world-famous headline, the Pentagon told the Black Vault they had no records on any program that Elizondo had described. Not a single piece of evidence whatsoever. A couple months after that, the Navy denied they gave anything to the ATIP program, despite what Elizondo had claimed. And then just months after that, the Pentagon issued a statement that was the most damning of all. They claimed that Elizondo had no assigned responsibilities on the ATIP program that he had brought into the spotlight. As the months and years passed since the initial headlines, the Black Vault became highly critical of Elizondo's claims. This is not a popular stance to take, and as social media can easily prove, that type of stance can come with a little bit of heat. But it wasn't just Elizondo on the receiving end of criticism. The Pentagon and the entire U.S. government has had a history of covering up UFO data for decades. And it appeared that's exactly what they may be doing again. But to what extent? My guest today is the man who started it all, Luis Elizondo himself. Despite the Black Vault's criticism, and admittedly the nitpicking of every single detail in order to find the absolute truth, Elizondo has agreed to step into the vault and share his side of the story in a special one-on-one -on -one interview. Stay tuned. You're about to journey inside the Black Vault. That's right, everybody. As always, thank you so much for tuning in and making this your podcast or your live stream of choice. I'm your host, John Greenwald Jr. And to say that I am, well, beyond excited about the next hour or so, uh, that would be an understatement. I've been looking forward to doing this with my guest, doing a sit down for quite some time now, I guess approaching probably about three years. And he has been nothing 
but gracious and a gentleman, despite my high criticism and my skepticism about some things that have come out. I don't want to waste any time. I want to bring on to the show, Mr. Luis Elizondo. I really, on behalf of everybody watching and listening, thank you for taking the time today to talk to all of us. Well, John, thank you. I appreciate it very much. Um, you know, I, I, I certainly appreciate your audience as well. Um, and, I, and I don't say this frivolously, um, I, and I've told you this before privately, you have managed to do things uh, in this, this arena that very few other individuals have, uh, have ever been able to accomplish, particularly your work in, in FOIA. Um, you know, for, for those who may not know, FOIA Freedom of Information Act was enacted in order to ensure transparency for the American public into government um, workings, if you will, uh, because in the past there had been some some issues with that, where the government may have overstepped its, its authorities and uh, as a result, so Congress enacts FOIA process. And I think there has probably never been anybody who has, sat, who has been as savvy in the FOIA process uh, than you. So thank you also for what you do. It's sincerely appreciated. Uh, I know not just for folks like me, but on behalf of everybody out there, your work in over the past, well, past few decades really has been been pretty incredible. I, I really appreciate those kind words. And as my audience is already seeing, and, and I'll say it again, despite that, that, that skepticism from me, you have always been that that gentleman and a scholar, you've always been open to me. Uh, you've spoken to me on the telephone and now you're doing this. Uh, but but I, I want to return that respect to you. And I hope everybody realizes that I've tried to say that on social media, uh, but also the fact that you're here. And, and I want this as kind of a housekeeping note for those listening and watching. I ask all my guests this and all of them can attest to it. However, I did ask the same question to you, which was, is there anything you don't want me to go into? And you have never once told me, even though I've asked you, uh, I've quadruple checked that uh, through the last few months as we've set this up, you've never once said, nope, don't go here. Nope, don't go there. You've always said the same thing, which was everything's on the table. So uh, my respect to you for that and for being here. And let's just kind of jump right right into it. What I want to do and how yeah. I structured this interview is essentially take a, a chronological look at some of uh, maybe some stuff that you've already talked about, but also filling in the holes. Some questions may be a little bit sensitive we might get into some areas where you go sorry john i ain't going to talk to you about that uh and and uh, and so i'll apologize if, in advance if i start pushing those buttons uh but that's who i am i have to push them so take me back to the beginning if you could on how you became involved in a tip and exactly how that came to be yeah uh, i'm gonna do that but before i do that john let me also offer one one uh, mia copa and apology also to you and i'm not sure that that we really ever had a chance to address this. But the bottom line is that years ago, you try, I try to make myself as approachable as possible. And uh, years ago, I, I know several years ago, you tried to reach out and um, try to have a conversation with me. And unfortunately, that message never got to me. And uh, I, I want to apologize because I do, I do think we should have probably had this conversation three years ago. And uh, probably th every year after that as well. <laughs> uh, and because that information never got to me, um, unfortunately, we never gave you a reply, a response that you deserved. And so I want to, I want to say here and now, I'm really, really sorry. Uh, we never had a chance to do this earlier. I, I think this conversation is a long time coming, coming, and I, I really do appreciate sincerely your patience thus far. I promise you, it was not intentional on my part. Um, I just never knew you had even inquired to speak with me until after, you know, we actually had talked the first time and you had said, Hey, Lou, I've been trying to get a hold of you for, you know, X amount of months. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I had no idea. So I, I want to apologize here, you know, on air, just so, so, you know, um, that was never intentional. Well, I appreciate that. No, you, somebody taught me a long time ago, you don't know what you don't know, and there's no need to apologize, but accept it anyway. Um, but I appreciate you pointing that out. Thank you. So back to ATIP, uh, how did I get involved? Um, let's rewind the clock to about 2008, and I'll give you kind of the, the synopsis of how all this evolved. Um, I was working uh, prior to that at the uh, Office of the Director of National Intelligence. Uh, I was a uh, senior intelligence officer working um, policy, strategy, things like that. 
And to be quite frankly, uh, frank with you, the, the, the drive was killing me. I was living on Maryland's Eastern shore at the time. And you're looking at a three hour commute one way. Um, I loved my job. I love the people, but the commute was killing me. So uh, at the time, um, it was then Under Secretary of Defense for Intelligence, Jim Clapper, was over at the USDI, and he was the Under Secretary of Defense for Intelligence at the time, uh, and a man I, I respected greatly. And I was given an opportunity to come back to DOD for about a year um, to to work some some new efforts, particularly in intelligence sharing, law enforcement, information integration. And so I, I came back very eager because my my daily commute was cut about in half all of a sudden. Uh, and I had my a uh, little bit more of my life back. So I went back to DOD. And it was at that time uh, I was working um, in the National Capital Region, NCR region, where um, some people had come to my to my desk. We were working. I wasn't in the Pentagon at the time. We were working at a remote location, but still connected to the Pentagon. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of bizarre because you're like out of, out of a movie. Um, these two people, I still remember today very clearly from what they were wearing, very nicely dressed. Uh, and um, I remember someone knocking on the door and said, Mr. Elizondo, there's, there's some people here to see you, which, which is not uncommon. You know, you, you're you always working issues, so you're trying to fix things. Uh, so, so sure, bring them on in. They came in and uh, they said, hey, uh, you, you're, you're Luis Elizondo. And I said, yes, I, I am Lou. Uh, can we talk to you? And I said, sure. And one of them shut the door behind them, my door. And I'm like, okay, <laughs> this is probably not good. You know, uh, I often joke, you know, what did I do now, right? Um, I, I probably upset somebody. And uh, they sat down and uh, they started to say, you know, hey, look, uh, we, we are part of the intelligence community. Uh, we're part of a program. We're not going to tell you much about it. But uh, do you mind telling us a little bit about yourself? And uh, I, I probably was a little rude. I probably was a little bit standoffish because I don't particularly like talking about myself, especially if I don't know who you are. Um, and they started asking very pointed questions, so specifically about, you know, we hear that you're, you're, you're a counterintelligence guy. We hear that you did some background uh, before. You have some background uh, in advanced uh, avionics and aerospace industry. Uh, is that true? And yes, do you mind sharing with us? I said, well, I'll share with you at the unclassified level the type of systems I worked on, but I'm really not comfortable going into any more detail. And so long story short, they agreed to, to they would come back and have another discussion with me. Um, and so when they left, I ran some trap lines to find out that they were legit. They were part of a, a special program, but I, I didn't have clearance into it. So I really didn't know, but they really were who they said they were. They were part of a, a small organization. And I presumed at the time it had something to do with aerospace, but I really didn't know. And then a couple more trips, they came by, we talked, got a little bit more comfortable. They got more comfortable with me. I certainly got more comfortable with them. And finally, they said, we'd like to uh, have you meet our director. And I said, okay, sure, no problem. Uh, it might have been, John, probably seven or 10 days later, we, I had an appointment to go meet. The, I was hoping the director would come see me. Mm -hmm. I, I, I thought I was sufficiently senior enough where, you know, you want to come see me, you can come see me. Instead, I, they're like, okay, be at this location at this time, at this place, and don't tell anybody you're coming. Uh, so, again, a little bit unusual. I'm like, you know, I'm sorry, who are you? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so um, I decided to go ahead and do it. And uh, I told my deputy at the time, hey, I'm going to go go to this meeting. Um, I went to it. And uh, it was at undisclosed location in, in also the National Capital Region. Um, looked a bit just like a normal office building, really, uh, until you go inside and then you realize that you have, you know, guards and whatnot. And you're like, okay, no, this is probably a little bit more, more sensitive. I remember going up the elevator up to the floor and uh, it looked like a, it looked like a, an office building you would see like on wall street, really, um, you know, cubicles all over the place and people kind of making copies and doing work diligently on, on their computers. And there was this corner office, um, kind of looked like a well, glass, you know, and the individual sitting back in there. And what struck me is that the individual was, I don't want to stereotype, but if you would ever think of what a rocket scientist looks like, he was your quintessential rocket scientist. Mm -hmm. Glasses, um, you know, very, very, look, look, appeared very astute um, and very no nonsense. Um, so I went, I, I introduced myself, shook his hand. Hey, glad you're here. He didn't smile. He was just very serious. And he was, man, he looked at me. He was staring at me. I, I felt almost a little uncomfortable because I know he was assessing the hell out of me and I was trying to assess him as well. But obviously he probably knew a little bit more about me than I knew about him. 
which is never really good to go into a meeting like that as an intelligence officer. You know, you kind of want to, if you will, know thy enemy. Uh, not saying he was my enemy by any stretch, but, you know, you want, want to know who you're dealing with. Uh, and he introduced himself. And um, I'm sure at some point his name will become become very public. I, I have, I have, out of respect for him, I've never mentioned his name. Uh, he's asked me never to mention it uh, until he's comfortable with, with his name being out, so I won't. Um, but we talked, we had a very good candid conversation and that's when he asked me, I mean, he started, he started asking me about my background in, uh, in, uh, aerospace and, and the type of technologies I worked on. And, um, you know, th this is a guy who I really, he knew his stuff and he was like literally a rock, literally by definition, a rocket scientist mm -hmm. and probably one of the best ones that we had in the government. Um, and that's when, you know, he asked me, he said, what do you, what do you think about, um, I, I can't, it was, you know, John, he, he looked him straight in the face and looking back, it's, it's, it was so weird because I wasn't sure if he was like testing me or if it was legit, but he said, what do you think about the topic of UFOs? Now coming from my world, you know, we'll, to test somebody, we will use provocative statements sometimes and then gauge their body language and, you know, micro behaviors and neuro linguistics, mm -hmm. uh, to see if, you know, they're prone to, you know, flights of fancy and things like that, you know, and, uh, but he, he was, he was looking at me very serious. And I said, well, I, I, I don't really think about UFOs. And he says, what, you don't think they're real? I said, no, no, I didn't say that. I just, I never really had the luxury to think about UFOs. You know, I'm not particularly a, a huge science fiction fan. I, I never really watched X-Files or anything like that. Uh, and I've been so consumed with my work that when I'm not working, I'm at home uh, and I'm a father. But those are really the only things I ever have time for, work. And, and which didn't involve mm -hmm. anything at all involved in those clearly and, um, and, and, and raising a family. So he said, okay, that's, that's fair. Um, and he said, but let me, let me, uh, just caution you, excuse me, caution you or warn you something to that effect. Let me caution you that, um, don't let your analytic bias, um, get in the way. And, uh, he said, you're going to, you're going to see things that you may not, you may have a hard time reconciling. Now, at this mm -hmm. point, I hadn't even accepted it. I didn't. Even, I hadn't been offered even really a job, right? So yeah. I'm thinking to myself, are you, are you? Is this a pitch? Are you offering me a job? Or is this just? Is this just advice for life? You know, to take with me. And what what the hell's really going on here? So uh, I nodded my head and said, No, you know, very, very fair point, right? Uh, I don't really have an opinion yet on it. And then we agreed, uh, had another conversation. But he said, Look, I'm looking for a counterintelligence guy. Um, for, for those in your audience who may not know what really counterintelligence is, and a lot of people think they know what CI is. CI is, is really um, knowing what the enemy knows about you, right? So, so foreign intelligence collection is, is learning what the bad guys know. Counterintelligence is knowing what the bad guys know about you. So if you think of a chessboard, mm -hmm. um, if you are playing chess against an opponent, um, you know, Foreign intelligence is knowing what their pieces can do on the chessboard and how they plan to move. Counterintelligence is knowing what they know about your pieces, right, and how you can move. So uh, it's it's yet another layer of, of 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 playing chess to some degree, I guess. Um, you know, not, not any better or worse than mm -hmm. other forms of intelligence. It's just it's a very niche uh, way of doing business uh, from an intelligence perspective. So uh, he started looking for a counterintelligence guy um, because we know that there are some foreign countries, foreign adversaries out there that, that probably know what we're doing. And I, I need a good counterintelligence and security program, which, by the way, it's not unusual. Um, anytime you have a sensitive program, uh, you know, you, you want to have you want to have good security and counterintelligence expertise. It's just it's just an extra layer of, if you will, um, insurance mm -hmm. uh, to have to, to protect your program. So it wasn't unusual that I was that I was being asked to provide counterintelligence expertise. I wasn't being asked to do anything with UFOs per se. It was just to come in and provide, you know, the, the background that I already have, just use that in this capacity. So um, ultimately, long story short, I mean, obviously the rest is history. Uh, no pun intended. I, 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 I said, sure, I'll, 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 I'll accept the job. Um, and it was at that point, um, through through various conversations afterwards, I began to realize that these guys are legit. They're real. I mean, they have like real data and uh, the individuals that they started that were part of this effort. I knew from before, like people like Hal Pudoff and whatnot that were, you know, they were kind of legends in their own time anyways. Um, 
So I knew this was a serious, legitimate effort. And then I began to see the documentation uh, from the Senate and Congress. And I, I really began to recognize that this was a full-fledged program. But they really did need counterintelligence expertise. They didn't have anything. So they were kind of, they were kind of vulnerable from that perspective. Um, yeah, I know it's probably a long-winded explanation. No, but, that's okay. But there go. That's, I mean, that's obviously, how I yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I appreciate it because I want the, the groundwork here. Now, um, in, in this next question, I want you to kind of clarify. You can do it quickly uh, if you could. The difference between what we learned of the advanced aerospace uh, weapons. Uh, now I'm drawing a point. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. The OSAP program, and I get tongue, tongue tied, uh, versus the program that you joined, uh, that you just mm -hmm. described, the Advanced Aerospace Threat Identification Program, or ATIP. What was the difference between the two? Because this has been yeah. an area of much confusion, not only by myself, but it seems like those that even worked on the program, which I'll explain yeah, in a moment. Yeah, absolutely. Not, but, not, not only you, but I mean, honestly, probably to all of us that's to some degree in the beginning. So in the, in, the, in the very beginning days, there was very little difference between OSAP and ATIP. There really wasn't a, 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 a clear line distinction. Um, there, were, there were focuses of the same effort. Um, and what it was, you had portions of OSAP, which, of course, now know Bigelow Aerospace was part of. Uh, had some incredible scientists working at uh, at the at the ranch facility. And by the way, other places, it wasn't just the ranch. Uh, and, and, and just, just to jump just in, to just to clarify, you're talking about Skinwalker Ranch. I am. Okay. Yeah. So so you're, and this uh, is another one. But since you brought it up, I'll just ask it really quick. So so a tip or OSAP or both operated on the grounds of Skinwalker Ranch in Utah. Uh, I want to be careful. I don't want to answer for. a Bob Bigelow or the former director of the program, because those are probably nuances you'd have to ask them. Okay. I will say that it involved uh, the ranch, um, OSAP, was that it was looking at looking at the phenomenon through um, through a very broad lens, um, and uh, you know that's that's what they were doing. Okay. Um, and by the way, there was some pretty compelling data. I'm gonna, I'm, I'll share with you that it was there was some very compelling data. Um, some of it was was a little bit disturbing, to be honest with you. But uh, in 2009, a the decision was really made to formally, if you will, um, partition off that that part of the study uh, involving the UAP phenomena under ATIP. And the reason why is because we were getting data from all different sensor platforms that weren't necessarily ranch related. These were, you know, of course, everybody now knows Nimitz and all these other other cases. Um, but, you know, you had, you know, strategic carrier groups out in 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 certain AORs, um, areas of operation, if you will, where where we were picking up UAP activity. And so we realized that there was a really a, a, a concerted need to to focus on the topic of UAPs uh, from a nuts and bolts perspective. Now, let me caveat. A lot of people, when I say that, they kind of retract and say, yeah, but you can't look at these from a nuts and bolts perspective. You have to, you know, look at this from this perspective and that perspective. And, and you know what? They could be absolutely right. But in the Department of Defense, we we had to be able to, to do two things, and that's qualify and quantify data. Otherwise, for us, it was useless. I'm not saying it is useless. I'm saying for our purposes, in the Department of Defense briefing senior leadership, that unless I can qualify and quantify data, it's 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 conjecture. Mm -hmm. it, it, there's 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 no there there. I can't do anything with it. So, um, and, and there was enough sufficient data coming in where we could. I mean, we could say there were these many incidents occurring in this particular month in these particular parts of the waters with these particular assets. Um, you know, these are the videos or pictures that were taken and radar information. And so it 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 helps you paint a compelling picture to to leadership um of, of 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 an event that is occurring or events that are occurring and so that decision really started to occur started to solidify in 2009 and that's why you see i think in the in senator reed's now now infamous letter that came out everybody now knows about all the way back in 2009 to De then deputy secretary lynn um that he wanted to take this portion of a tip this you actually see the advanced aerospace threat identification program become a formalized effort and, and put that into, into SAP channels to protect it. Uh, because we knew based upon the efforts that were going on with all SAP that you had two camps. You had some people that really supported the effort 
And then you had some people that really didn't support the effort. And by the way, this isn't just with WASAP. We saw this before with Hal Pudoff's program, with Stargate and the remote viewing program, that you know, anytime the government was dealing with something that was um, maybe maybe uh, a bit unconventional, fringe, it, it, it would tend to, <laughs> if considered <laughs> yeah, by some fringe, it ruffled a lot of feathers. And mm. so, um, you know, the, I guess the solution then, the mindset was let's let's take this program that's kind of exposed, and let's put it under this umbrella of SAP where we can protect it. Uh, and, you know, we can still continue to collect the information without fear of, of people on the outside not understanding what we're doing and having this knee-jerk reaction to, I ah, just shut it down. So um, that's that's kind of how that all evolved. Gotcha. So then OSAP, from what it sounds like, was, was completely different. ATIP was branching off on just UAP investigations. Fair to say that? that yeah, I mean, that- from my perspective, I mean, I'm, I'm sure if you talk to people that were in OSAP, that we're still doing stump stuff in the ATIP side of the house and vice versa. They would probably tell you it was more of a gray area. There wasn't really a hard, in the early days, in the end, there was, but in the early days, there wasn't really a hard transition or if you will, if you will event, an event horizon yeah. separating the OSAP program and the ATIP. There was kind of a, a, a blurry line there that sometimes shifted. But by 2010, we were firmly, by 2010, nine really, but in 10, it was, there was no question about it. ATIP was its own focus area. I want to ask you about the some of the public documentation, the verified information that has come out, uh, and that sure. is uh, involving OSAP. Now, I know that you didn't lead OSAP, and sometimes you don't like to talk about it, but I do want to ask you something that also encompasses ATIP, which is that public documentation has absolutely zero mention of paranormal ufos uaps unidentified craft and so on that rather it was a more of a forward-looking program at least that's what the public bid solicitation stated where i have a a very big question on this is that disconnect from what we know to then bass getting the contract it's a uap study uh and then that bores out uh, atip and voila we have the rest is is history what what am I missing just by looking at that okay. documentation? Yeah. So, what's so that that's a great question. So anytime you look at any governmental solicitation, we call these solic- contract solicitation, this goes out to the public sphere, right? And that means anybody and everybody can look at it to include Russians because it's a contract. You're spending American taxpayer dollars to do job X, Y, Z. So even when you want to build a B-2 bomber, right? in Air Force contracts, you don't put out a contract saying, hey, we want somebody to come out and build a super secret spell, space stealth you know, technology. Let me repeat that again. Sorry about that. Even when you're doing the B-2 bomber and you want to do a solicitation for someone to build you a super secret stealth bomber, right? Uh, you don't, you don't, in the solicitation, it will never say that. It will say very nebulous, ambiguous language because you don't want to tip off to your foreign adversaries key technology that you're trying to develop or build. So it's the same thing with this. Um, when when the solicitation, which by the way, for the record, I wasn't part of. Sure, yeah, and I, and I, I, I can tell you from general perspective how, how we do this. Um, at the unclassified level, you're going to see these solicitations always very generalized. Um, and that is specifically because you don't want to tip your hand unnecessarily to your foreign adversaries, that you're working on project A, B, C, or D. Sure. And so- that's why you see it. I would, I would, I would challenge anybody in your audience to go ahead and look at other solicitations. You know, now we can look back and, and you know, look back 10, 15 years, look at some of those technologies back then that we were really protecting, whether it's drone technology, right, for to help us on the global war on terror. Those solicitations, when you read those unclassified solicitations, almost read nothing like the classified portion of what the job really is. You, you, in fact, when you look at it, you're going to see. You know, I've read this solicitation six times. I still have no idea what it's for. So it's let, so ambiguous in general. And let me jump in there because uh, I get a lot of heat for bringing this up. And I don't think it's as bad of an act, quote unquote accusation. I'm not accusing anybody, but I don't think it's as bad of a thing as people make it sound like when I pose this. But if there's a classified portion of a bid solicitation, right, and and you have that public setting and then you have something behind the scenes that only cleared personnel can see when contractors come in. Mm -hmm. I'm with you on all of that. However, in kind of digging into that area where I get myself into trouble from some people 
is that Bigelow Aerospace, who obviously has a vested interest in this, personal interest, has invested a lot of his own money away from ATIP and OSAP and all that uh, into the UAP phenomena. If he's not right up front getting that classified description, he sees the public part, they bid on it. What are the odds that that organization gets this contract to secretly, uh, in a classified setting, investigate UAPs? And according to the Defense Intelligence Agency, he's the only one out of every government contractee that uh, contractor that that could actually uh, bid on this. He's the only one. And uh, that leads to a discussion about a sweetheart deal. I doubt you want to comment on that. Uh, but I bring it up just simply because that's the disconnect that I still don't sure. understand because he can't grab that classified portion of the solicitation or correct me if I'm wrong before he gets granted the contract. Right. Well, I, 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 I can't comment on it because I wasn't there, sure. but I can comment on it from the perspective of a couple things. So first of all, I, I do know Mr. Bigelow personally. He's an amazing human being. Um, anybody who, who's never had the chance to meet this guy, he, he really is an American hero. Uh, he has he has contributed more to this topic behind the scenes, I think, than than, than just about anybody. Um, certainly, even more than certainly more than I have. So um, that's the first thing. Second of all, I think if you look at aerospace in general, look at Lockheed Martin, look at Boeing, look at Northrop Grumman, and all these others. You know, there's only certain companies that can build an F twenty two. Right. And at the end of the day, it's up to two companies. I think you had Lockheed and then you had, you know, the, the other guys that they wind up going with. Um, you know, a lot of times there are contracts where you might tell somebody ahead of time, look, we're going to write this contract. You're probably the only company that can do it. Um, so just be advised that this contract may be coming out at some point uh, because there's only a certain amount of certain certain companies that can do certain things you wouldn't expect for example um look at the early days when we had jeep i'm a jeep guy right so i, I love old war jeeps the korean war world war ii jeeps a lot of people don't realize people look at a jeep and say oh that was you know that was a, 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 a jeep product but there were a lot of companies that were making jeeps in the early days of world war ii you had ford making them and then you had of course uh, you know the overland jeep overland company and you had some other organization that were bidding for a contract and at the end of the day, it turned out to be only only two companies, from my understanding, that actually got the Jeep contract. Mm -hmm. uh, and then later, it wound up being just one, believe it or not. Um, so uh, it's it's a bit convoluted the way that contracting world works. Um, it's not perfect, but at the same time, I think there's enough oversight now. When you look at how how contracts are selected, they're not selected by anybody who's connected really to the contract. They're connected by an outside independent organization. Uh, and there's a reason for that, because you have to be fair and unbiased. Now, I don't know this to be true, but I've been told that apparently uh, Bigelow was the only one, Bigelow Bass was the only one to actually bid for the contract. So, you know, naturally, if you only have one bidder and they have the qualifications, they're probably going to get the contract. Um, but I, I unfortunately, like I said, that yeah, all I occurred you. before my time. Sure. I came in really in 2008. That that ship had sailed back in 2007. Um, so I, I I truly, honestly can't tell you exactly how it went down, only because I wasn't there for it. I got you. Fair enough. During the ATIP days, I want to talk a little bit about the, the controversy. Uh, we're about halfway through the interview, and I, I want to make sure that I give you ample time to address some of this. And that is the government's reaction to you coming out. You resign. Uh, sure. You come out. You uh, become a part of To The Stars Academy. Uh, you bring videos along with you. I'm going to combine like 700 of the questions that I have here for, 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 sure. for time reasons. But I, I want to talk about that controversy. Let me ask first, quickly, if I may, at what point you, re you resigned October 4, 2017, if I remember correctly, uh, you had submitted your, your resignation letter. At what point did you meet Tom DeLong and plan to join to the stars Academy and bring all of this information to light. Yeah. I, I, I had made a decision to leave. Actually, I'd spoke with my dear, my dear colleague and friend, Chris Mellon, and it was, you know, it was a soul searching moment for me. And, uh, finally I made the decision. I said, look, you know, I, I, I can't fix this on the inside. I, I can't, this is a guy, this is 
Secretary Mattis is a guy that I had been in, been in combat with, served with, and, and just an amazing human being. Uh, and, and it, you know, the bureaucracy, unfortunately, was such, it, it just wasn't getting the information to the right people. And so sometimes, you know, in a situation like that, you do what you have to do. Mm-hmm. And in order to, to fix the problem, I, I, I felt that I had to, I had to leave the organization because I knew they wouldn't be able to stop. The one thing they couldn't stop would be my resignation memo. And by the way, let's, let's not forget that almost a year later to the day, Secretary Mattis did the same thing. He resigned, right? Mm-hmm. So rather than cause problems inside the system, in the Department of Defense, you know, if if you can't solve it, you need to get out of the way, and you don't don't stay in a system that you don't don't agree with. If it's if it's really problematic, then resign so the organization organization can continue doing what it's supposed to do, and you don't become, uh, if you will, um, a friction point. Mm-hmm. Um, that's just kind of a a code of honor we have. Uh, in, in the department. It, it's it's common. You see it in all the services. It's just what happens. As far as uh, meeting Tom DeLong, it wasn't until afterwards. Actually, once I resigned is when um, I was approached to say, hey, Lou, you know, there's this little organization over here led by some guy, some some rock star, which for the record, when you're, when you're a guy like me used to living in the shadows, that's the last thing you want to do is ever be in any kind of spotlight. Sure. That's just, that's not our character. It's not the way we, we operate. Uh, but when I realized that it was Hal and Steve Justice and Chris Mallon and Jim Semivan on board, whoa, now those are people I do know. Now, don't get me wrong. Tom's a great guy, but, mm-hmm. but I never knew the guy, you know, from Adam being in the intelligence community. You know, I, I might have been able to pick out a song, uh, but had no idea who, who this guy was and, and really didn't, didn't pay attention to it. But when I saw who else was on and you had the advisors like Dr. Norm Kahn, uh, and some of these other really big names that I had a chance to work with while I was in the intelligence community. Whoa, uh, now that's that's significant. This guy may be a punk rocker, but he managed to get these folks together in the yeah. same room and support this cause. You know, that's 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 a hell of an accomplishment, you know. And so I was like, wow, that's that's really hard to say no to. Um especially when you have those people on board um, that and there was a lot more people that were affiliated with TTSA that's not publicly known but again some some pretty significant people who I had the honor and pleasure to serve with back in my day in the military and Department of Defense and later on in, in the intelligence community so that was really for me I, I had a conversation with my wife and said look you know what do you think? And, you know, she says, well, you, you know, these people and, you know, do you trust them? And the answer is, you know, emphatically, yes, I do trust them with my life. Um, so that was kind of an easy decision for me. So you had known Christopher Mellon prior to resigning. Uh, it sounds like you had a conversation yes. with him, but did yeah. not, did not know anyone else uh, when it came to, to the stars Academy until after you resigned. And it was, it seems like, no, then, I knew how put off. I, I knew how, oh, then, all the, then, how, how it worked for Sure, he was part. Yeah, and I'm sorry, a a backtrack. Did then? Did you know? Did he tell you about to the stars before you? I think it was Jim Semivan who who I who actually said, "Hey, why don't you consider jumping on board with us?" If I remember now, don't hold me to it, but I mean, we're going back three years now. Sure, I'm pretty certain it was Jim who who actually was the one to offer me a a, a position. pre-resignation or or post just for chronological no, post 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 no, gotcha post. i got gotcha. you so you yeah because i think they knew that i was going to wind up working at you know, i got to be careful though i, I, I want to put a plug in for it i was going to wind up working you know at a, at a probably at a supermarket uh just to uh just to pay my bills afterwards because you know even though i had left the department i, I i'm not the age of retirement yet i can't collect my pension so you know i, I still i still needed employment Gotcha. Okay. So you joined to the Stars Academy. It all seems to happen pretty quick after you had resigned because a couple of weeks go by and you're uh, on stage. It was very fast. Yeah, yeah it yeah, was very fast. Sounds like it. So, and you, you brought yeah. with you a couple videos. I want to focus in on that now and, and then we'll, we'll get more to the, the DOD's sure. reaction. But just to be clear, I didn't actually bring those videos. That wasn't me. I did not. I, I facilitated the process of getting them releasable through Department of Defense channels. But I didn't actually bring them. That was somebody else. Okay, so you had filed the paperwork, obviously. That, that yes, okay, I did. And, I did. And by the way, with after having a, a long discussion with my team, 
because I was a senior guy, I'm the one who had to request it, but it was a, a mutual decision that we would go. So, so the initial intent, John, was to have a unclassified repository because that was my experience before when I was working in the Department of Defense, was really setting up these special enclaves where you could share very sensitive national level intelligence via what we call a terror line and getting that information down to a level could be consumable by by anybody out there that's you know local law enforcement state authorities anybody like that um that's that's actionable information but it was super classified so you have to come up with a mechanism where people who don't necessarily have a security clearance can access really really classified information so there's a mechanism to do that so that kind of was my forte for some time so we wanted to build an unclassified repository where information could be put on that was not super uber uber sensitive there wasn't any like classified metadata or uh call signs or locational information but we could create this database that allowed other people from the outside to look at this and say oh uh because we we didn't we really we went through analysis after analysis and we were still coming up with a goose egg we had no idea what the hell these things were we were hoping that maybe some other people say yeah you know what we picked that up too and and maybe some some state authorities in you know kansas said yeah actually mm -hmm. we've been seeing these things over our, our nuclear facilities or i'm just as an example right yeah. i'm not saying just kansas and nuclear facilities sure i got you giving it as an example a lot of people but, are going to read uh, into that and go on kansas nuclear what's right, going on? right right that's what i'm saying it's anecdotal just yeah. right. it's anecdotal <laughs> yeah there's going to be blogs you know. about this in about an hour so <laughs> <laughs> i know god i promise you i don't really mean can yeah I'm just uh -huh. saying it for the conversation um but my point being is that uh we we're trying to create a an enclave that allowed us to share this information that came from u.s government sources to a broader audience and in industry uh the, you know the, the big boys boeings of the world and the raytheons and try to get more people into the conversation because we really had no idea what we were dealing with and and even the folks that we were working with in other agencies were scratching their head i mean to the point where i remember one meeting john we 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 did such mental gymnastics trying to come up with there was one particular video i won't go into detail but it was, it was so so incredible that we were doing these mental gymnastics trying to come up with a what if scenario what technology would this have to be to be able to do this yeah and it was one of being so preposterous, so so ridiculously over the top. We all just kind of looked at ourselves and said, "All right, that's <laughs> there's no way that that was you know that could be what it is." Um, so that was again a long, uh, probably a, a much longer winded response that you were looking for. But that's, no, no, you mentioned a video, Lou. Uh, can you tell me what video that was? <clears throat> uh the ones that we got released yes so it was no no the ones that uh, you came up with the explanation not to step on you oh <laughs> no unfortunately i cannot <laughs> well, i knew i'd get letters no, if, I, if i didn't try I, i'm no longer in the u.s government no i, got you. I you but know i uh i have to be careful those those you know um i i want to be be very clear that um you know the it's us government's business to determine what is releasable and not not mine okay um i got you and uh anything that i may have been been exposed to back in atip i, I really uh, until the government gives gives the green light i just i just can't i just had to push you on that one you mentioned yeah, it, no, so hey, i had, I had to i had to go so let me ask you uh, one of the few sensitive questions that that i talked about in the beginning and that is the paperwork that came out through foia i went after those documents as you know uh, we've talked about this privately but uh, i went after those documents for those listening and watching that aren't aware and and found the emails that you were sharing back and forth uh, with what is called Dopser, and that is the arm that essentially will authorize either public use or uh, essentially them declassifying something or if something's unclassified and clearing it for release and so on, just to kind of quickly summarize it. Those documents come out in, in the form uh, that had already leaked in part had come out, uh, but that was kind of re-verified on an official level. And the way you would describe the videos uh, is what it, what really kind of, intrigues me in a way that is a big fat question mark and that is that you describe the FLIR, the gimbal and the go fast as balloons uh, drones and uas's and what kind of confuses me about that is dopser is cleared 
at the top secret level. So they've got the, you know, JWIX protocols to send them to, let's say, top secret data, and they review it. They can say, nope, you can't use this whatsoever, uh, but they have those channels. I've heard, but I want to ask from you because I don't think I've ever asked you this part before. I've only heard from others through, you know, third hand info that you felt that you couldn't inform them properly. Uh, but again, I want to ask you this. Why were the videos described in that way if they would be cleared at the top secret level? Sure. So if you look at the way Dobster works, you're actually supposed to do the request at the unclassified level. So there's several DOD instructions and direct actually instructions uh, and manuals, and then there's some some brochures on how you're supposed to request something for publication, meaning that can be disseminated out, and that is through an, an unclassified document 1910. And when you ask Dobson, they say, "Please send it to us unclassified level." So we had just gotten over the 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 this this awful situation with WikiLeaks, where we knew foreign adversaries were hacking our systems. That's a fact. That's 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 not conjecture. And, and the U.S. government acknowledged that. And then, of course, you had insider threats where you had, uh, look, I don't want to get political here, but there's, you know, what are you for or against, but folks like like Private Manning uh, that, that took some very sensitive information and released it in an unauthorized manner. So because we were dealing with something that was so sensitive and there was so few people that were read onto the program and I couldn't even brief my boss at the time about this this program i couldn't very well brief dobser who's two and three degrees removed from my own chain of command and mention the word ufo so the uas uh we had coined for unidentified aerial systems some say unmanned aerial systems but literally a uas is an unmanned or uh uh system that's not manned by a human being so that's that's actually a, a a legitimate term that we could use without saying ufo or uap knowing that the oca the original classification authority who Dobson would have to go back to anyways right to get the approval was read right onto the program and knew exactly what this was about so so um you know, a lot of people say well was that disingenuous we we're trying to mislead no 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 everybody was about everybody knew what we were talking about but it was a way that we could protect this from having some sort of what we call an inadvertent disclosure. This information getting out to somebody who wasn't read on, and all of a sudden now the whole department is aware of what's going on. So that's that's how that's how that, if you will, that process gotcha. occurred. Okay, so one of the other things on the the same form was your intended use. Now, for those just tuning in or maybe missed the part uh, earlier in the show, you had said you did not bring these videos out. Somebody else did. So I want to make sure that I repeat that. But internally, the paperwork showed that you only intended this for internal government use only, not intended. Correct. Initially, to- correct. Initially, that's what we were. We wanted to create a, a an internal enclave, unclassified. So, you know, the public... Could, could, I, we put industry partners because that's broad enough where if you're working with the United States government in any type of capacity, you could be labeled as a type of industry partner. So whether you're uh, local law enforcement or your FAA or you're one of the services or, you know, whoever, if you're working in some sort of kind of official capacity, we wanted to give people who had a had certain expertise open the aperture so we could get more scientists more people to look at this data and help us try to figure it out. And that was what you internally called the community of interest, right? Or COI, yeah. which, which COI, is, yes. yeah, I, I've always, once those emails kind of revealed themselves through FOIA, I was always intrigued by that because that sounds like, wow, why didn't they do this prior? So, you know, I've, I've as, as an outsider, exactly. yeah, one would think. Right. So, so that, uh, and by the way, I've gone after, I think I may have told you privately, but trying to find more information, if any is there, did they take that idea? Because, from what I've seen, when you look at these types, there's of a lot more info, John. <laughs> well, that's Keep plugging away. You're that's doing what, great. Right, that's what I'm. That's what I'm going for. So, so, but at, at very admirable intention there. But again, I just wanted to ask, according to the DOD, anyway, that those videos had to adhere to what was on that what they call the DD form 1910, which we didn't label it yet. Uh, but the DD form 1910 was uh, again for that that private 
U.S. government use only. And when Christopher Mellon had come out recently, he had said that he supplied the, those videos to the New York Times. Then in the James Fox's great documentary, getting rave reviews around the world. James, I've known for a very long time. So quick shout out to him. Make sure you watch his new documentary yeah. called. The yeah, Phenomenon. he did a fantastic job. He really did. Yeah, he's he's a he's a great human being. I know how much blood, sweat and tears went into that just from knowing him personally. So my kudos to him. Uh, but in that Christopher Mellon came out and said somebody didn't name them, but somebody bent the rules. That was uh, what his uh, wording was which I want to juxtapose that with how we were shown the videos from to the stars Academy. I don't expect you to speak for to the stars. I'm not asking you to, but I do want to ask about what they called the chain of custody, because that's another one of those disconnects where paperwork says internal use only cleared for that. Then we see the videos and it, they were kind of advertised at, well, not kind of, they were advertised as going through the declassification process through DOD and, uh, they had chain of custody documentation. And that has always confused me because that for me, anyway, I found the DOD chain of custody forms and stuff like that. It just wouldn't apply. Is that accurate? Yeah, so, what, what is that chain so, of custody? You know, I, I can't speak for Chris Mellon and quite frankly, I've never asked Chris. I don't want to know. Uh, you know, there's, <laughs> I hate to say plausible deniability is sometimes a good thing. Uh, but out of respect for Chris, I, I, I've never asked him this source, and I don't really plan to, to be honest with you. That's between Chris and, and whoever he talked to. Um, you know, the, the how TTSA wound up putting them forward, um, I will tell you, if you were to ask me, you know, I, I probably would have been more hesitant to do that. But, you know, it happened. Um, and it happened without me knowing, <laughs> um, that really was, so you had my, no idea that they, co- that they were going to release those videos. Uh, not until the, uh, New York times article. Yeah. Uh, that was not, um, I, I was not, a, I was not aware. Um, yeah. So. Were you aware they had them? If I can ask that. No. Actually, um, let me think. John, I, I don't recall. I, I really don't. I don't think because I remember being very surprised uh, because the intent originally was for a community of interest and unclassified, but for official use only, if you will, community of interest. Uh, and I, I didn't I wasn't the one who, who provided them. So I really don't know what TTSA was thinking. You probably want to talk to them. As you know, I'm no longer um, um, publicly affiliated with, with TTSA. They're, they're great people. Uh, Tom's a great guy. You know, we yeah. still talk, uh, but um, I, I can't speak for TTSA. I got you. No, I, and I understand that um, and respect that. And, and I want to actually ask you about that, but I do want to make sure I have enough time to ask you this uh, kind of round of questions, which is, the DOD's reaction to all of this, that after you resigned, after these videos came out in the way that you did, which you've already outlined, obviously internally, this created kind of a riff. We can see that. Oh, yeah. Uh, Oh, hey, listen, life was very uncomfortable for Lou Elizondo for a long time. I Uh, I would imagine. It was, well, first of all, you had the problem. Most people didn't know the program was real, so they thought Lou went, you know, deep six. He went, Lou went crazy. Uh, and then as it started to unfold internally, they're like, oh, sh- crap, this program was real. And, you know, we never got briefed on it because Lou was going to the much higher levels with this program. Then it, they got some, some people in there, well, two, two camps. One said, oh, wow, you know what? Yeah, uh, we better, we better uh, not treat Lou so harshly because he had very, very senior people in the loop. He was actually doing his job. Then you had another faction of people saying, well, he still should have told me, so let's burn him to the ground. Let's launch an investigation. Let's uh, pull his security clearance and uh, let's, you know, let's do everything we can to, to uh, blow up his credibility. And um, there are still some pockets of those that of those individuals that exist. I think that's probably why you see, you know, despite the senator and all these people coming out saying, yeah, it was real. And yeah, Lou was the guy running it. And all these how obvious things that people look back and say, well, that's obvious back then it wasn't. Yeah. Um, 
and there were people, there were factions in the in the DOD that were not very happy with me. And those are the same factions that are still influencing some of your FOIA process, mm -hmm. where you know something exists, but they come back saying, "Man, nothing to see here." Yeah, and you might have to try three or four times before you finally get something, and you're like, you know, what the heck? How, how come now I'm only I'm only getting this when I requested it, you know, two years ago. Yeah. Um, they're in a tough spot and I don't want to disparage the DOD because I do think, I don't think we can hold accountable a few people there for, for that dysfunction and blame the entire department because, because the department of defense is very, very good at what it does. Uh, the acting secretary right now is a fantastic human being. The guy is a, is a, is a national hero. I won't go into details because you may be watching this, but but the guy was there in the early days of Afghanistan. I mean, super, super person. Uh, and and that is representative of most of the Department of Defense. They're good people that want to do a good job for the American people. The problem is you get some bureaucrats in there and people that are are political. And, you know, there, there becomes a, an issue about ego. And just because I wasn't told about something, therefore it must not exist. Well, that's not necessarily so. And it wasn't up to me to tell because when you look at that 2009 memo from the Senate, the, 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 the access list to that program was super, super small. I, I can't just go out and brief somebody. <laughs> yeah. I, just, I don't have the authority to do that. I get in trouble. So uh, that created a lot of, uh, a lot of challenges for me and, you know, I, I often tell people say, well, Lou, why did you just back then say A, B and C? Well, because I made a promise to certain people and I wasn't going to to violate that trust. I knew damn well getting into this that this was going to be an uphill battle. I had probably a five percent chance of mission success, which isn't very good. Those mm -hmm. are not good odds. Don't go to Vegas with those odds. Um, but I had a, a heart to heart with my team members and we in order for this for this topic to to finally get the light that it deserved, someone had to step out. Mm -hmm. And that someone, I, I, being a military guy, it had to be me. I was a senior guy. So, And, and let me ask you, just shoulders. focusing in on, on the DOD, what I call they, they took a shot at you, and I apologize if that phrasing is not appropriate, um, but essentially, <laughs> you know, they, they took a shot at your credibility, uh, and, and they're challenging you as a person, as a dedicated military, uh, then later civilian employee of the Department of Defense. They are by name taking uh, uh, this credibility shot at you. And I will admit when that story broke, I was surprised despite my, again, that, that criticism, uh, which you have not shied away from that you've always spoken to me about. And I want to point out again, for those who missed it in the beginning, how admirable that is to you because you're not afraid of these questions, uh, nor were you privately when we chatted on the phone or through email. But when they did that, I just kind of like took a step back and I'm like, okay, I'm not, th this isn't about Luis Elizondo for me. This is about what is the truth behind what I believe is this active UFO cover up. after they right. did that, uh, the sp let's zero in on the spokespeople because they did that. We don't have to name names or make accusations, but sure, sure, you know, sure. the, the spokespeople did this and they took that essential shot. Why, why don't you take a, a shot back and just say, look, here is the irrefutable proof. And let me just quickly preface why I'm asking that is that I've seen that there are a very, and this is post, posted publicly, a small list of people that include a couple journalists and one UFO, what I would call like a UFO blogger uh, in particular, that have made reference to you showing them documentation, it, what they call irrefutable proof that you are who you say you are. Now, I'm not challenging that. I believe that they saw something. Uh, let me just quickly ask, yes or no, is that classified information? It's not classified, no, okay. but understand that I'm not going to give up the identities of other individuals just to save my skin. I've never been sure. that way. I'm uh, not that guy. What you know, if I could have I could have settled this three years ago. And you know, there when you talk to Senator Reed himself, mm -hmm. that's for the record. He's telling you, yeah, Lou is the guy running the program. When you talk to Hal Pudoff, who was working for me, who's clearly part of ATIP, yeah, I worked for Lou. I mean, these are, I don't need to go toe-to-toe -to -toe and get into a mudslinging contest 
with the Pentagon when they've already flip-flopped on their position six times. Mm -hmm. First, they came out and said, yeah, ATIP was real. It was about UFOs and Lou ran it. Then they came back and said, well, no, ATIP uh, wasn't about UFOs. Then they said, well, ATIP was about UFOs, but Lou didn't run it. I mean, it's, if, if you look at the track record, and I know, I know, we, you know, you've, you've seen this over and over again. Sure. You know, my position has been consistent and I've been backed up by, by everybody that needs to back me up. This isn't about Lou Elizondo. It's not about me. If I make it about Lou Elizondo, then we take away from the progress we've made. Look how far we've come mm-hmm. in three years. In th- just three years, John, we have now the videos coming out that were official government videos, never before released, the acknowledgement that they're real, the acknowledgement that they are some sort of unidentified aerial phenomenon, mm-hmm. the establishment of a UAP task force, Congress being briefed at the classified levels. By the way, if you don't think I was part of that program, how in the hell do you think I ever made it on the Hill to brief mm-hmm. people? I mean, it's it's at this point, it's kind of silly, I know, and I don't need to rehash all this because we could go for half an hour, laundry list of laundry list. The bottom line, John, it's not about me. I don't really care what people think about me. Never have, never will. This is about this is about this this incredible movement for for transparency and and real meaningful disclosure. Yeah, I mean that's what's more important: me going up and saying, "Hey, look at me," and I'm you know going to go ahead and 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 make the government look silly. No, because we still need to work with the government. If I did that, then we run the chance of just to just so I can go ahead and quote unquote, prove who I am, which I don't need to prove anybody. Don't really give a damn what people Sure. Think. Yeah, I got you. Just to prove that, I risk now putting my guys that are still there in the program where now all of a sudden it's it, it gets shut down because it becomes too hot of a topic. Yeah. Now the Pentagon's getting sued by Lou Elizondo. Now there's defamation character. Now there's this. Nobody wants to touch that hot potato. Nobody does. So, and by the way, to come out and say, here's document one, two, three, four, five, it's not classified. But it's it's legit of what it is. With, with there's people on those emails that are still engaged in those efforts, and I can't compromise them. I won't do it. I never have. I never will. Mm-hmm. So until those people come out, which at some point I'm sure they will, then people come out of those documents and say, "Oh wow, look at that. That isn't that interesting." But until that occurs, I'm not I'm I'm not going to do it just to 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 save face. I'm I'm not that guy. I never have been. I'm not going to come out there and say, ah, because this isn't about Lou. It never has been about Lou. And this is why I try to tell people, you know, people say, well, Lou's now the face of, of, of these UFOs. I'm not the face. Look in the mirror. You're the face. It's everybody out there in your audience. They're the face of this. I just happen to be one of the tools in the tool bag, like Chris Mellon and, and other people. But this is, this is a long game. We are, you know, I hate to say we're in a running gun battle here, but this is, this is a long war not a short war. This yeah. isn't about instant gratification. This isn't about, you know, Lou going up there and making the Department of Defense look stupid. They've already have they've already put themselves in that box. I don't need to help them with that. Yeah. You know, in fact, what they need is a solution so they can continue to tackle this problem without people coming in and getting mad at them because that's that's really what they need. And if I do anything to to poke the bear, all it's going to do is 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 make the situation worse when really we're trying to help find a solution. I got and you. by the way, if it's at my expense, I'll take it, John. I'm okay with it. If if the cost of us getting this far in three years is people say, "Meh, lose full of it," you know what? Fine, I'll, I'll take it because enough people know exactly who I am and what I did. And by the way, this story is still unfolding. It's just not over. So there's a lot more to this narrative that when it comes out, people are going to go, "Wow, okay, that's interesting. I had no idea." What I only have a couple minutes left. I, I again I appreciate your time, and I yeah. want to work this in. If, if my audience has heard me talk about these types of issues a lot, passing it to you. If there's one thing that I haven't covered, but you want to talk about or say or a message or anything, what would that be? You know, boy. Let me, let me say this. I believe as dysfunctional as our, our family of, of, of UFO enthusiasts are, whether it's UFO Twitter or UAP research group, et cetera, et cetera, we have achieved this together. And yes, even the naysayers, even those contrarians, even those skeptics, 
we need you. We need them all. Come on board because this is a conversation that affects all of us and no one owns the narrative. I'm not out pushing a book. I'm not, I'm, I'm just, I'm, anybody who wants to have a conversation with me can have a conversation. We are achieving this together. And that is the success here. It's not that John Greenwald is doing the FOIA or Lou Elizondo is out there doing TV shows or anybody else. It's everybody doing what they do best in this sphere that is creating this moment in time that we have never seen the likes before. We need it. And it's okay. I don't mind if I have haters. That's okay. If that's the cost of doing business and that's the cost of doing business, the, the, the truth has nothing to fear. So I would encourage people to, to know that, that the sex, success we are seeing right now is a result of all of our contributions, not just one person. Uh, and, and I think everybody plays a vital role in this. Um, you know, we would not be where we are today, John, if you hadn't done and are doing the things you're doing from your perspective. That, by the way, nobody's as good as doing it as you are. Just like there are certain things that I can do um, because of my access to to help happen and Chris Mellon and and yes, even everybody on out there in the in the UAP Twitter world, they're making a difference. They're they're campaigning. The, uh, look at Marco Rubio when he just came out and said not too long ago. That's because people are telling him it's okay to have this conversation. We want to know. It's interesting, right? We're not going to talk about Elvis on the mothership anymore in tinfoil hats. This is a serious topic that deserves serious attention. And and whether you realize it or not, John, people begin to look at you. And if you want to know what the face of disclosure looks like, you're looking at it. It's it's. I'm looking at it right now. You're part of that. People out there, like uh, uh, you know, the the. I got to be careful. I don't want to plug any particular people out there. But there's a um, there's a, a huge sea of of advocates out there in social media that are writing the congressman, writing the government. They're do they're learning from you. I mean, how amazing is that, right? People are now learning from John Greenwald's playbook and FOIA, and it's working. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's, at some point, you know, you, you can't stop the tidal wave. So. I would. I guess my 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 final thought on this would be: don't stop doing what you're doing. You know, you don't have to be in anyone's camp. Just keep doing what you're doing. And then I would also say: beware of those selling the snake oil. Beware of those who are telling you about these preconceived narratives that they have in their mind, and are saying, "No, don't pay attention to those guys." That's the real threat. When someone tells you, "Don't listen to that person," that's the real threat. I encourage you, you know what, listen to anybody and everybody you want to listen to and then make up your own mind. That's my word of advice to anybody out there who wants to know about this topic. And by the way, no, there is no expert out there. I don't care who you are or what you say. I was in it for 10 years working for the U.S. government, and I'm not an expert. So that would be my advice to people. And by the way, when they say, well, Lou, you're pushing the threat narrative. No, I'm not. I'm pushing a narrative that they could be a threat if they wanted to be because we don't have enough information. That's what I've always maintained. And if you think it's fear mongering, well, then fine. I mean, if you think you have some sort of special relationship with the UFO and, you know, you want to charge people money so they can have a, you know, close encounter, you know, while you're paying pilots to drop flares. Okay, fine. I don't know. You know, do whatever you want. I just, I, I think, I think we need to, I think we need to have a, a, a conversation where everybody has a voice and we stop trying to mute each other. I think that's the real danger. Those are great words. And by the way, the threat potential narrative, I have agreed since day one with you guys, as TTSA as a whole, obviously has dealt with that a lot. Uh, I've done FOIA requests upon FOIA requests on that that threat potential. It's very real. I don't know why people are afraid of the T word. I know I'm out of time. If I could ask you just one more question, yeah, absolutely. Uh, because I want you to have the opportunity to respond because this is all kind of unfolding sure. right now. As you mentioned, you've decided to, as you put it, not be affiliated with TTSA, although you still have high respect for them. Um, I've been kind of waiting. I've reached out to them uh, unrelated to this show, but uh, reached out to them to get like some type of you know, res- uh, response, press release. Are they informing their investors only because I know my listeners and watchers want to be updated on that. So can I ask you just kind of a two, two-parter here? 
Uh, is there a, a, a reason why you've decided to not be affiliated anymore? And the second part, which is the most important to me, is where does that leave off on the CRADA agreement with uh, the uh, U.S. Army where you guys are taking uh, pieces of UAPs that you have collected uh, over the last couple of years? created a legend we, we we don't know legend. if they're actually i just want to be fair but sure. say, oh you, you have to, let's let's Sorry. caveat that you know uh, yeah, we, I gotcha. we really don't know we want to just make we, we're doing our due diligence we're trying to find out gotcha and and thank you for that and so you've got these these alleged pieces of, of uap that you're going to have analyzed through this army agreement you're listed on there you're the main contact i forget what the exact wording was in the agreement it's been a while so that's my last question to you is why did you choose to leave and where does that leave us with that sure. CRADA agreement and was there anything that transpired thus far yeah so i i again i people are going to get mad at me for saying this i can't speak for ttsa i can only speak for myself um, what i have mentioned before is that ttsa is a company and they owe their investors um a, a results right which is all good companies should do be stewards of investment um where my expertise lies, specifically me and Luis Elizondo, is not necessarily uh, in the entertainment division, which is where TTSA does a lot of its focus areas on. Um, and for me, my skill sets um, are probably better used in a different capacity. Um, so that decision was made. Um, my, my, I have, again, all my friends at TTSA, I love them dearly, great people, great human beings. Um, but, um, you know, this is battlefields evolve, battlefields change. They're not static, right? They're an evolving situation. And sometimes you have to move troops around the battlefield in order to, 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 to win the battle, right? That's not uncommon. You don't just sit there, uh, in, in, in rank and file and just march forward. You, you, you have to adapt with the environment and the, and the, the situation as it's evolving. And that's very much what what i'm doing this is again a long game let me remind people that you know we have achieved a lot in three years but i think if we want to achieve more in the next three years we have to adapt we have to adapt we have to continue moving the ball forward and sometimes look at a football game right the quarterback doesn't do the same thing every time the quarterback's got to change plays otherwise you know the, the guys know what you're doing and then they figure you out and you lose the game so you gotta you gotta you can't ever take for granted the battle space that we're operating in. And I say battle space because I'm a, again, people say, oh, there's that threat narrative again. No, no, it's just the way I talk. I'm a military guy, right? So uh, I, I look at everything as a, as a military style campaign or an intelligence campaign, right? It's a multi prong, it's a, it's a multi dimensional battle space. I tell people, you know, there's several ways you can look at the battle space. Some people look at battle space like the game Connect Four, some people look at the battle space like checkers. Some people look at the battle space like three-dimensional chess. And that's kind of the way I think, you know, we need to look at this. This this is no different. This is a very complex, highly evolving topic where we're learning every day more and more and more. So we have to maintain our, our momentum by always adapting to, to the environment and anticipating not just the environment of tomorrow, but the environment next week, next month, next year. So we can stay ahead. Will you, uh, you asked me another question. I didn't want yeah, to. Will you stay forget. connected with that CRADA agreement? Uh, or are you essentially out of that? Yeah. Well, uh, okay. So again, as it relates to TTSA, I can't speak about that. I can tell you that we're always looking for opportunities for new partnerships, right? This being a perfect example, you and I having this conversation, this is a partnership. This is, this is what it is. You know, uh, whether you like me or hate me, or I like you or hate you or whatever, we are working with each other because you hate, you hate because me? we realize. I'm sorry. I said you hate me. No, 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 no. <laughs> I'm, I'm just kidding. saying. I'm in just general kidding. terms, whether you. whether you know whether we like or hate each other. No, actually, for the record, I actually I, I like you, but that's inconsequential. It doesn't matter if I like you. That's my point. The point is that we each have a, a role to play, and and we we need each other if we want to continue to push the ball down down the field, just like we need everybody else right now on social media in this, in this crazy grassroots effort, we need to call it UFO Twitter, right? Or, or, or the UAP research, uh, enclave. I mean, I, it's working, it's working again. I can tell people don't look now, but 
you're achieving what you're, what you're setting out to do. So um, I, I think people shouldn't be surprised if I continue to, to engage certain elements in the U.S. government for the purposes of research. Um, that, that, that's probably a no-brainer, I think. Most people should. If they see that, that shouldn't be a surprise. Well, look, I can ask you questions all day. I'm down to 6,437 left to go. My guess is we're probably not, not uh, you know, in a position to ask them all right now. So tell you what, I hope that after this last hour or so that you will come back, uh, that, that you will continue um, this conversation with me because I hope that you've realized not only through this last hour, but obviously we've shared a lot of conversations privately uh, you know, and, and, and I hope you know where I'm coming from and you started this with an apology to me and I want to end it with one to you. I caught myself by critiquing the story that was coming out, then starting to shift towards, uh, it being personal, not by intent, but it came off that way. And for you, I apologize. I've already done it privately, but I want to do it publicly. No worries, in John. That, no worries. The Listen, per- we're, this is, we're in this together, man. And, and this is something that I think, you know, my concern for you, my biggest concern, I've told you this privately, just having me on your show, I'm concerned that there are going to be some of your, your followers, fans, uh, you know, folks, your associates that may criticize you for this. They may say, Oh, you're drinking the Kool-Aid. Oh, yeah. you know, you're, uh, you're, you're falling for misinformation for Lou. I hope that's not the case for you. I really hope that by doing, having this conversation together, people realize on both sides that, you know, we, we can work together. We should be working together. Um, I, I, I hope this doesn't have any negative impact for you. If anybody out there is listening and they think that this is some sort of, of scheme you and I came up with, it's not. Uh, what you see is what you get. This is very um, frank. John did not, you did not load me with any questions beforehand. Everything you've asked me, uh, you've asked me without me knowing ahead of time. Um, so hopefully people see that level of transparency and, um, you know, maybe we, we can show them that, you know, we all can work together. Yeah. We should be working. Together. And, and I hope that this serves as an example of that. You've been so gracious with your time. I blew through the agreed amount. So I appreciate your willingness to take a little bit more time with me. You're welcome back anytime. You know, my number, you know, my email, please uh, know. John, you got mine. Same I, thing. People know, just give me a call. Give me a, uh, give me a couple of days head notice because I do have a honey do list. I have to, I have to stay on top of, but, uh, um, I'm happy to have a conversation anytime. Absolutely been my honor and pleasure. And I really appreciate it. And by the way, thank you for what you do. I'm telling you, you are, and I've told people this privately, I've told them publicly, there's only one John Greenwald that can do what, that does what you do. Um, it's, it's amazing what you've been able to achieve and accomplish using the government system against itself. Um, that takes a high degree of savvy and sophistication that not everybody really understands or appreciates. Uh, but, um, you know, I, I, I see it with you and you, you play a vital role. So thank you for what you do. Well, I appreciate that. I always love ruffling feathers wherever those feathers may lie. So thank you for that. And <laughs> you're uh, really and good I, at it. <laughs> yeah, thanks. I appreciate that. And thanks again for your time and your graciousness. And thank you all for listening and or watching. This is John Greenwald Jr. signing off. We'll see you next time.